dive in directly to my presentation, Sustainable Food System, uh, a Paradigm Shift. I think much has been said already about COVID-19. So for my presentation, I would just like to focus on how this global pandemic has exposed the fragility of our broken food systems, its inequalities and injustices, and how nature is very much interlinked. Over the last several decades, we have seen profound changes in the way food is grown, processed, distributed, consumed, and wasted, which have resulted in the creation of food systems that increasingly push climate change, biodiversity loss, shifts in nutrient cycles, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, and land use beyond the capacity of our planet. The increased occurrence of viruses is closely linked to food production and profitability for big industrial corporations. Investments reach forests, and smallholder farms, even in the remotest areas, driving deforestation and development, which lead to disease emergence. The disturbance through conversion of forests and lands caused previously boxed in pathogens to spill over into local livestock and human communities. Although we have this problem now of the pandemic, we are also saying that it is closely linked to the productivist narrative. While COVID-19 is a major threat to food security, we all know that the state of food security and nutrition, even before the outbreak of COVID-19, was already alarming. Some staggering data on the state of food insecurity and malnutrition were already presented on day one. Like climate change and other challenges that family farmers are now facing, our broken food systems are results of a cycle of destructive practices and policy choices that worsens imbalances of power. A lot of it has to do with the way we view food systems. The prevailing narrative is one many people call as feed the world or productivist narrative, which focuses on the quantity of food and calories produced. It is based on assumptions that we need to double food production by 2050, maximize yields, and base our production on export-oriented models from the global north. Efforts to minimize the social, health, or ecological costs are considered but seen as less important than the goal of increasing food production to feed the world. And because of this narrative, the full picture is often lost from view. Here, I would just like to highlight how um, data show that increase in agriculture has already far outstripped the population growth. You can see from the slide that there's a lot of production already and it's growing faster than its population, but only 43% of the global cereal production is used directly as food. So you can see here that the remainder, 36%, is used for feed and the rest are used for other industrial products. The same is true with how the agricultural land acquisition for crops in million hectares, according to destination of use, can be seen in this chart. And you can see that only 3.3% of the total land acquisition, or about 10%, is used exclusively for food crops. And the rest, the bigger chunk, is actually used for multiple use, including fuels and non-food crops. So you can see there's a lot of competition on the food that is being produced. And we can say that the world trade has enormous impact on agriculture policies in many developing countries. Rather than providing the population with food or promoting the development of domestic markets in rural areas, government and local elites frequently pursue the primary goal of generating foreign currency and tax revenue from agricultural exports. So you can see from the graph how the least developed countries have higher imports than exports. And apart from minerals, the 48 poorest countries of the world, or the LDCs, have hardly any other export products than agricultural commodities. So neglecting domestic food production in favor of the cultivation of cash crops has caused high import bills for them. As net importers of food, 
our countries become dependent on world market prices, over which we have no influence. The least developed countries and the poor in rural areas are the losers of global trade and its ongoing liberalization. As net buyers of food, we are extremely vulnerable when there are pandemics like what we have now. Food exporting countries will naturally prioritize their own needs. In the Philippines, for instance, we are now importing maybe 60% of our food. That was already a problem even before the crisis. We have no food security, even in basic crops like rice. And yet our domestic agricultural sector is largely unprofitable. The only one that makes real money are those exporting cash crops. So the retreat of the states from agricultural production has really resulted to corporate concentration. In the process, smaller size food producers have been marginalized because although they can be highly productive per hectare of land and highly resource efficient, if provided with adequate support, they are less competitive under prevalent market conditions. The larger agribusiness corporation is such that these actors have acquired, in effect, a veto power in the political system. In effect, the global food security is now in the hands of a big, big corporation, which is really scary. So the prevailing narrative has resulted in unsustainable food systems that harm human, ecological, and animal health. We need to balance power relations and empower family farmers so they can participate meaningfully in nation building. We cannot continue business as usual. It is not an option. Transformational change is a must. The crisis has exposed the weaknesses and the underlying risks, inequities in our food systems. Obviously, we cannot go back to the same broken systems. We need radical change if we want to be more efficient, sustainable, and eventually achieve genuine food security and avoid another disastrous pandemic in the future. We need to facilitate urgent transition to sustainable food systems, we hope that the lessons of this pandemic will help diverse actors identify and prioritize the policies, practices, and business models that align human, ecological, and animal health outcomes. So instead of intensive farming, the emphasis has to shift to agroecological farming systems. Apart from the strong environmental benefits of agroecology, which we all know, it also provides social and health benefits. Diverse farming systems contribute to more diverse diets for the communities that produce their own food, thus improving nutrition. We need to rebuild our local economies based on agriculture. The first and foremost requirement is to accept the important role of agriculture can play in revitalizing the economy in the years to come. The economic concept that encourages farmers to be forced out of agriculture to the cities where cheaper labor is needed has to change. If agriculture becomes economically viable, the rural economy too undergoes a rapid transformation, thereby drastically reducing the rural urban migration. Local food system can be rebuilt through appropriate investments in infrastructure, packaging and processing facilities, and distribution channels, and by allowing smallholder farmers to organize themselves in ways that yield economies of scale and allow them to move towards high value activities in food supply chain. Also, the traditional food, including the neglected and underutilized plant species that are found in the local food systems are proven to be of high nutritional value, which can boost immunity system, a highly relevant factor for mitigation strategies in these types of pandemic. To help sustain these efforts, capacities of smallholder farmers and indigenous communities, especially women and youth, should be enhanced. Food systems must be reshaped in order to be more inclusive of women and youth who have generally been disadvantaged in the past, both as a result of inequitable food chains and because agricultural technologies have not taken into account their specific needs. Governments could achieve this by providing strong support to this particular sector based on the provision of public goods for training, storage, and connection to markets and on the dissemination of agroecological modes of production. Um, we need to bring back the integrity of scientific research as a public good. The intellectual property regime has eroded the values of scientific researches in such a way that most agricultural researches now are done to serve the interests of big corporations instead of serving the family farmers. Sorry that I don't have much time to elaborate on all the items that I have provided in the slide, but uh, just to leave you this quote 
which I don't remember anymore where I get it. I hope this will inspire us all to, to move towards a better, sustainable and resilient food systems for all. Thank you. Ang buhay, ang pamilyang magsasaka